Praise the Lord. Praise God. We hear that ukulele coming from that part of the house about all day, every day. She practices a lot, and we're just thankful for her using her talent for the Lord on Wednesday nights, and I appreciate her this evening. We're going to continue our series on faith tonight. We're going to talk about aggressive faith uh, tonight and again next Wednesday night. As I told you, this is a long one, so I'm breaking it up into two different sessions. But uh, you can turn to the book of Luke, chapter 10, and also the book of Acts. Just Acts chapter 1, we'll be looking in chapter 1 and chapter 2. But uh, we'll be reading a few of those verses starting off tonight. And there goes over half the church right there. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. Thankful for the Lord, thankful for his blessings in this this series on faith. I hope that you've been getting uh, plenty out of this. I know I have, and and preparing it, and uh, getting prepared and teaching it. It's it's like a Sunday school uh, lesson, really. It's laid out for you, and it's always dangerous to give a preacher something that's already laid out for him. All he has to do is preach it, but uh, it's powerful. The school of Christ, the whole school of Christ is powerful. And um, here, after revival, we'll go into a new series on prayer. But uh, we'll be finishing this up tonight and then next Wednesday night. So I'm going to break this up into two. Luke chapter 10, verse number 19, we read, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Acts 2 and 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Then Acts 1 and 8, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of of the earth. Father, we're thankful tonight for your word. We're thankful for the faith that you have placed within us in this whole study that we've talked about, knowing that belief plus action equals faith, and and how we put it to action in our lives, and how we walk in faith, and it's the gift that you've given us. And Lord, tonight, I pray that you'd anoint us tonight and next Wednesday night as we finish up this thought on faith, and we talk about aggressive faith. And I just pray, God, that you'd help us to be men and women of action, that we'd have that aggression in the faith, in the spirit, not in the physical realm that we're speaking about, but that aggressiveness in the spirit. And I just pray, Lord, that you would just anoint us to deliver it the way that you've placed it, to be delivered tonight, and that we receive in the same fashion. And we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. In our first scripture there in Luke 10, verse 19, Jesus made a promise. He made a promise to his disciples, and he made that promise to his disciples. He also made it to us as the readers that he promised to them that he was going to give them power over all the power of the enemy. Then in Acts chapter 2, when they gathered in that upper room, verse 4, we read that they actually received that power. In the third chapter of the book of Acts, Peter said, Such as I have, give I thee. So we have the promise of the power, then we see it actually being given to the men, and then you see the action of the man who received it who said, such as I have. What did he have? The power. The power that Jesus said that he would have. All of his promises are yes and amen. He's not a man that he should lie. He's not slack concerning his promises. He told them that they would receive power. Not only did they receive power, they put that power to action. So we see that in the life of Peter. Peter was saying to that man at that beautiful gate, I've got something yesterday in that upper room, and that something is the power of God. That something uh, came from heaven. It's the promise of the Father. So he then took that power and raised a man that had been crippled for 40 years. Now, it's an aggression. It was that aggressiveness of uh, Peter that demonstrates his faith. He could have said, I think I have. He could have said, maybe I have. 
He could have been wishy-washy in it, but something happened to him uh, which made him know that he had it. And he said to him, such as I have, give I unto thee. He knew he didn't have any money. He knew that he didn't have anything monetarily uh, or physical to offer him. uh, But he knew what he got in that upper room. He knew that he received the promise uh, that Jesus said that he would receive. And he knew what he had. And we've got to get to the place that uh, it's not, well, I think I got the Holy Ghost. Or I may have the Holy Ghost. No, you know if you have the Holy Ghost or not. Uh, And so you know if you've been filled uh, with that power or not. Uh, So we look at the possibilities that exist for us in God, and we find it uh, not just for these fishermen, this fisherman, uh, but not just for the apostles of that time, uh, that ex- but they exist for you and I today. He said, all power uh, in heaven and in earth has been given me. Note that he said, both in heaven and in earth. So by the Spirit, he who has all power gives himself in turn to you and me. And so we find that in Jesus. Jesus is the source of power. Not the power of human thought, but the power of Christ. We find that millions have been, uh, uh, been to uh, seen a repeat of Pentecost. We've received the Spirit of God um, in the exact same manner that they received Him on the day of Pentecost. Uh, speaking in tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. Uh, on many occasions, He's come with visible tongues of fire, uh, just as it happened to those that were present that day. Uh, it was just a few chapters later. Uh, uh, that was uh, upon the disciples and the 120 believers, but it was just a few chapters later, uh, I believe in Acts 11, uh, at Cornelius' house, that Peter went there, and the very same thing uh, that happened in the upper room happened uh, in uh, Cornelius' house, uh, and the problem that they had with that, many had with that, is they were Gentiles. Uh, Peter said, all that I can tell you is the same thing I felt in that upper room uh, I felt in Cornelius' house. Uh, The same Holy Ghost that fell there, uh, fell there, and I just preached uh, what the Lord told me to preach and he did what he did and it's been happening ever since and we need to pray that we need to to pray for that outpouring of the Holy Ghost who will fill all the house uh, where they were sitting where the, whether there's 120 or there's 12 uh, he said that where two or three are gathered together in his name uh, there he'll be in the midst uh, so we don't need to worry about the number that is there but we need to worry about the number uh, that is expecting the power to fall Because they were in one accord in one place. They went there looking for the promise. Those that gathered in Cornelius' house, God already spoke to them, and Peter was the man uh, that God sent them to get uh, that came there. Uh, so whatever, whoever is gathered, uh, that they will we see a repeat of Pentecost over and over again. Now, although many of us have received the promise, we have not reached a place of total dependence upon Him which would enable us to say to the blind, the halt, the lame, the lost, we have. And and that's the key. We have. We've got to know what we have. We have to know who we are. As we said uh, last week, too many people are too wishy-washy in their profession of faith uh, because they're afraid that it's not going to happen the way that they proclaim it. And we can't apologize for God's Word. God's Word says it. We say it. We profess it. We proclaim it. And we leave the rest up to God. Whether God heals the blind, the halt, the lame, the lost, that's between them and God. But we must claim that He still heals the blind. He still opens blinded eyes. He still raises up the lame. We have to grab them by the hand and pull them up in the name of Jesus and have that kind of faith. And that's the key in all in all of this. It's all in the Spirit of God. Peter made no apologies for the Spirit of God. He had listened to Christ all through the Gospels. Jesus said, I'm going to give you something. You shall receive power. Peter was listening to what he said and this was his last message before he was received up and Peter remembered that and then when he received it he did something with it Peter came out of the upper room and preached and 3,000 were saved he goes the next day to the gate called beautiful and grabs that man and pulls him up and says in the name of Jesus I give it unto you and he came walking and leaping and dancing into the temple Peter along with 120 others waited there in that upper room just as Christ commanded and when they did that the Holy Ghost came just as he promised and so when it came to the healing of the crippled man there in that third chapter of Acts Peter said such as I have 
love. He didn't heal him, but Peter received something that he could give away, and that was the key to it. A lame man was healed. A miracle took place, but more is implied there. This lame man is a picture of the spiritual cripple sitting at the gate of the church waiting on that moment when there will come something that will empower that church to make Christ real. It's important to recognize here with Peter and John that they were not leaving the temple. They didn't just come out of a, they came out of the upper room the day before, but they didn't just come out of a Pentecostal outpouring service where, where all of heaven came down. They were on their way to church. So that tells me that Peter and John wasn't like a lot in our day. They weren't dragging in. Right? Just, oh, we got to go to church. No, they were ready. They, they were so ready, they had something before they even got to church. Too many people are waiting until they get to church to say, bless me if you can't. But depending on the preacher to have enough to, to fill his lamp and their lamp. I, I hope you prayed up this week, preacher, because you've got to fill up 50 other people besides yourself. You've got to get them excited about God. We have to put a praise team across the platform to try to encourage people. Somebody come on and praise the Lord. Somebody say amen. Somebody worship the Lord. It's a shame when you have to beg people to praise the one to deliver them from hell. But that's where we're at today. But they didn't need that. They were on their way to the temple they had something before they got to church all what we could see that's the key is having something before we get here that we can say to somebody that's laying outside the gate saying you don't have to lay here and sit here it didn't just say that he leaped and jumped and ran but he leaped right into the house of God he didn't run down to the nearest bar he came running into the house of God why because they met the, the spiritual cripple at the door and said you don't have to wait out here you don't have to stay out here you can move into another realm and so that's what is is telling us it's implying here that we've got to have that power so when the spirit came upon that lame man he was healed immediately he went leaping and shouting and crowd a crowd gathered because of it five thousand men were converted in a single service as God came with his power So the church, that's who we are. We must again realize the potential there is in absolute dependence upon the Holy Ghost. Brother George talked Sunday night about a road to restoration and about how we have to to walk down that road and go down that road and continue uh, down that road. And that's only going to happen when we realize the potential that there is when we get absolutely dependent upon the Holy Ghost. We've got to break loose from attempting to do the work of God in ourselves. That is in our own power, thinking, I, I can do it. I can make it happen. Uh, and, and so many people are trying to, to make it happen. See, they, they have to come up with all these programs and ideas and all of these things uh, of making it happen, make church happen. Uh, they've made it an experience. And uh, we want you to come for this experience. I'm not looking for a one-day experience, but I'm looking for a lifestyle that is full uh, of the power of the Holy Ghost. Uh, it's not man-made. It's not uh, uh, cultivated by man ability. It's not about uh, uh, having someone there to setting the lighting just right. I've told you about that in that college class uh, that I took. They said you got to set the lights just right. you got to uh, have some incense going uh, and, and all of these things. Uh, and my thought, and I told the professor this, I'm not trying to seduce the congregation. Uh, I'm trying to see the power of God fall. Uh, and he said that these things come by nothing else but prayer and fasting. Uh, so I'm going to leave the lights on and leave the incense out uh, and pray that his glory will fill the temple and that's where we've got to get back to that place to understand that we don't do it through our power and through our ability all of you've known me long enough that I don't have that contagious personality that's going to make somebody do something but there is a spirit of God that will begin to fall on a little shy boy and the anointing will begin to flow and he can say something with importance that will reach out and touch the heart of a sinner or a backslider and see them come home and see the power fall when we realize it's not in us as man, but we possess this power in earth and vessels. It comes from the throne room of grace through the Holy Ghost and gives us that aggressive faith through total, total dependence upon the power of the Spirit of God. We can make Christ known in this generation. Only if we're totally dependent upon Him can we make Him known. 
And we've got to do that. Paul said it this way in Philippians 1 and 21, for to me to live is Christ. If for me to live is Christ. It's not I, he said in Galatians, it's not I, no longer I that live, but Christ in me. And if it's any other way, we're in trouble. If it's any other way, if your life is about you, I'll just put my name there. If, if my life is about Jamie, then I'm in trouble. When I make it about me and about what I want, I, I was reading a devotion this week from Brother Adrian Rogers, a, a wonderful Southern Baptist preacher has gone on to be with the Lord, uh, and he said we've got to get to the place uh, that is Christ in everything. It's Christ in our thoughts. It's Christ in our attitude. Uh, it's Christ in every area of our life uh, and how we eat and how we drink uh, and how we worship uh, and how we work and whatever we do. Uh, it can't just be Christ on Sunday uh, and Christ on Wednesday night uh, and maybe be Christ in the prayer meeting. Uh, but every day, uh, Paul said, for me to live is Christ. Uh, so when I get up and I take a breath, uh, I realize that my purpose is for Christ. It's for Christ. And, and I understand, and I, I do to a point, but then I don't to a point. Uh, but for, for some people, uh, church is a place that they attend. But for a pastor, church is my life. Church is my life. But it shouldn't just be that way for a pastor. It should be that way for every member. That everything that we do should be about this church. Because we have joined ourselves as members of the Middleburg Church of God, this part of the body of Christ. Not saying that we're the only church. I thank God for all of our other churches that are preaching the truth, the full gospel. I pray for them daily. But I'm not a member of that congregation. I'm not the pastor of that congregation. So my goal and my desire is for the health and the position, the spiritual health and growth of those within this body. Not just me as a pastor, but as I was talking about in the business meeting Sunday night. Me as a member, uh, my desire uh, is for the membership of this body. Uh, so everything I do, I keep in mind this church. Every decision I make, I keep in mind this church. A young man had gotten a lot of trouble. And he got in that trouble, and he was a part of the church. And the pastor called him into his office, and he sat the young man down. And the young man was real sorry for what he had done and the reproach uh, uh, that he had brought into himself. But he really didn't think about it. He said, really, his thought was, the only person I hurt was myself. The pastor sat him down in that office. He said, son, you may not realize this, but in your indecision, in your not thinking things through, in your sinfulness, I'm not trying to put guilt on you any more than what you already have, but I want you to understand this so next time the devil comes tempting, you'll make a better decision. He said, but when you did that sin, not only did you bring a reproach to yourself, you brought a reproach to me as your pastor because you're a member of this church. And not only did you bring a reproach to me as your pastor, I, I've not sinned, but your sin has now brought a reproach to my name because they say that hey, he's a part of that pastor and he's a part, he goes to his church. And so not only have you brought a reproach to you and me, but you've brought a reproach to this whole congregation, this whole church. And, he, and he's thinking, man, that's horrible. He said, but hold on, worse than all of that, you've brought a reproach to your heavenly father. So next time, Time, son, before you make a decision, uh, think about it. Uh, it may feel good for a moment. It may seem like uh, it's a good idea. Uh, so when we realize for me to live is Christ, uh, it makes us realize uh, if it for me to live is Christ, I better say, what would you have me to do? Uh, help me to do this. And how do we do that? Uh, not by asking ourselves all the time uh, and stressing ourselves out. Uh, I got to make sure I do right. Uh, because our works is as filthy rags. So if we're trying to do it in our own power and saying, I got to do right and I got to act right, let me tell you, if you got to keep making yourself live right and keep making yourself do right, you need to pray through because the problem is you're walking too much in the flesh. You're depending too much on your own power, and that is empty religion, and that will get you nowhere. That's just a religious man that says, I've got to do this to be saved, and I've got to do that that to be saved. Can I, can I give you a news alert? I can go to all the bars that I want to. I can. 
I can drink all the booze that I want to. I can. I won't go to heaven if I do those things, but I can do all that I want. But because for me to live as Christ, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't not go to a bar because somebody told me if you go to a bar of sin, you go to hell. But God took that desire out of me when I got saved. For me to live is no longer Jamie and his urges and his need. Does those urges rise up? Of course they do. Uh, we're going to fight this flesh until uh, they lay us in that grave. Uh, we're going to fight this flesh until that trumpet sounds. Uh, but we have got to be more than conquerors. Uh, we're already more than conquerors. We just have to put it to work and enforce it uh, and overcome sin. Uh, you don't have to say yes to every suggestion that the devil and the flesh makes. You got to say, no, for me to live is Christ. They say, well, you ain't really lived until you've done this. No, my living is for Christ. And if he wouldn't be pleased with that. How do I know that? Because he hasn't moved me in that direction. For me to do that, I'd be kicking against the pricks. I'd be going against him. So that was the sum and total of living for the apostle Paul. That was the only life for him was Christ. Is that the only life for us? Jesus, him alone. He's the only reason I live, one songwriter said, but oh, what a reason. Paul was constantly feeling his way into the enemy's territory. See, something about Jesus, something about Christ, is he didn't mind getting up in the devil's territory. When we're, when we're in, the, in ourselves, in our own power, we kind of want to avoid that stuff. We want, we want to stay away. We see where the devil's working, we say, I ain't messing with that. But when we're walking in the Spirit, I'm not saying we go chasing the devils, but we're not scared to walk up in his territory. We're not ashamed to step into his camp and say, devil, you're not taking that. I'm taking that back. And so Paul did that. He was all, always up in the devil's territory. He was allowing his faith to probe where other men had never been before. That's why he is known as one of the greatest men of God to ever live. He allowed his faith to disturb the enemy. Does your faith disturb the enemy? Or does he even realize that you're there? I want the enemy to be disturbed by the aggressive faith that we have. Paul's did. It's disturbed the enemy. It, touches the pla- it touched the places where Christ had not been preached yet. That's where Paul took it. For Paul to go to a city, you know what it meant to that city? It meant that city would never be the same. There was either going to be a revival or a revolt, one of the two, or both. They never said, Paul's just another preacher. He's never known that way. Paul was never known. He was known by a lot of things in Scripture, but not just another preacher. They either uh, left him on the road for dead, or they tried to hang a garland around his neck and make him a god. There was no in-between for Paul. The mighty power of God that he had in his life by virtue of being baptized in the Holy Ghost uh, was constantly in evidence. Not so much in the words that he spake, uh, but in what he was. We don't have to worry about the words. It's who we are. It's who we are. Our very existence. If we we make our life about Christ, can I let you know something? When you make your life all about Christ, the words you say are going to be powerful. The words you say are going to impact lives because you're careful with what you say. And you want to make sure that what what you say some may say, well, Brother James is a long-winded preacher, but believe it or not, I try to be very careful of what is said behind this pulpit. I don't want to use a lot of wasted words. I've preached for over 25 years, and, and I've never been one to say amen 157 times in a message. I haven't been one to, to beg for amens or come on. I, I don't have time to fill all of that space of waiting for somebody to give me their seal of approval on the message. If my message was not given the seal of pr- approval already, I wouldn't be preaching it from the pulpit. It's already been approved by heaven because it came from heaven. If it didn't come from heaven, I'm not delivering it. I, I don't deliver for self. I don't deliver for man. I I don't deliver for anyone else. I I receive what God has given me. So we have to not mince words, but just go and be in existence and allowing that faith to probe us to go where no one has ever gone before uh, and to know that that is the evidence. It's confident there. Uh, No words uh, that we speak may be always powerful, but our existence will be. He was given, uh, giving to a lost world what he had received. 
need to grab hold of that. He was giving to a lost world what he has received. So if we're going out and witnessing without a prayer life, we really don't have much to offer. We're, we're just going through the motions. If we've not come out of a prayer closet into the mission field, we're, we're going out there ill-prepared in a bad position. Paul said, just the same thing as Peter said, such as I have. Can you afford to give some of what you have to somebody else? I told you Sunday there's a coin shortage. I hope there's not a faith shortage in our lives that we say, I need to hold on to it. You know, like the one that said, well, I didn't have much, so I just kept it. I didn't do anything with it. And he said, I buried that talent because I figured I would need it later. Others begin to invest it. So that Paul said, I, I'm here to invest what I have and give what I have. And so he said, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power in 1 Corinthians 2 and 4. These words show his absolute dependence upon that which he had received. In Romans chapter 15, verse 19, Paul said this, Through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Through the power of the Spirit, Paul proclaimed the gospel, and he believed the whole of what Jesus said. And that's why we face today what I've told you from the beginning of this year, a need of restoration, is there's a broken gospel. The full gospel has not been preached. We have not fully preached the gospel of Christ. People have pulled out what they think will offend others to try to present to them a gospel, but that's not the gospel that saves. That's not the gospel that brings deliverance. That's the gospel that makes religious people. That's the gospel that gives a form of godliness, uh, denying the power thereof. Uh, that kind of gospel says, uh, well, if somehow you get filled with the Holy Ghost uh, and you begin to speak in tongues, just keep it quiet because you don't want to offend anybody else. Uh, that's not the gospel that Paul preached. Uh, he preached the full gospel uh, to say, let Jesus have his way. Uh, and he's saying that is key. Uh, and through the gospel of Christ, the power of the Spirit is proclaimed, and we believe everything that Jesus said. If we believe everything that Jesus said, belief plus action equals faith. We can't say we believe it if we're not putting into action in our lives daily. And so that's what Paul did. That's what Peter did. Many believe that they've been filled with the Holy Ghost. But yet they refuse to believe that the power Jesus said would be theirs is actually there. We've got to come to the place where we receive and then allow what we received to flow through us. It's not enough for us to say, well, I was filled. We weren't filled with the Holy Ghost just to give us goosebumps and to make us speak in tongues. People think it all about tongues. Have you spoken tongues? Paul didn't look at those Baptist boys on that road that day and say, have you spoken tongues since you believed? He said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? We have not so much heard there was a Holy Ghost. So he laid hands on them and prayed for them to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, and the same evidence in the upper room, they began to speak in tongues. If you're full of the Holy Ghost, you're going to speak in tongues. Uh, but tongues uh, is not all there is to the Holy Ghost. Uh, that's the outward evidence of it. Uh, and so he proclaimed this gospel. And we've got to come to that place uh, that we just allow him to flow through us uh, and to understand that we don't want to be like those uh, that, uh, that say they have something, but it's not flowing through their lives. It's our only reason for living. Hell glories in getting Christians to fight on the wrong front. The devil don't care how much we shout. The devil don't care how much you speak in tongues. There's no power in it. He don't care. He don't care what we do in here. It's what pushes us beyond here and pushes us to a place of being used for the Lord. If our problems stem from economics, then our economics will be able to take care of it. If they are strictly military, then the military can take care of it. Uh, but it's spiritual. It's not economical. We look at our society today, and they'll tell you our economy's in bad shape. It's not economical. Uh, they tell you COVID-19 is the problem, and the government's using it for their advantage. Uh, that's not our problem. Uh, that, that's not the pro It's not a medical issue that we're facing today. Uh, it, it's not an economic issue. 
issue that we're facing today. Uh, it's not on the military front. All of that uh, is an outsource of it, and it's a part of it. Uh, but what we have to realize, and nobody out there wants to talk about it, uh, there's not going to be a press conference held uh, to tell you this, uh, but it comes back to the church house that we know that it's a spiritual battle. We know that we wrestle against the prince and the power of the air. There's a real enemy that we're facing, and he is very busy. He's very busy. Look around you tonight. You can see how busy he is. A lot of distraction. I've told you before, if the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. Whatever he can do. I love preaching and teaching on Wednesday night. And even when I wasn't preaching and teaching on Wednesday night, I love to be the one sitting there receiving that, uh, right in the middle of a work week. I'd do whatever I could to get to the house of God on Wednesday night because I needed that. But there, there's so many things. People say, well, I can't come to church uh, because I'm dirty. Come in here in your work boots. I don't care. Come in here uh, smelling like you just got off the back of the garbage truck. Maybe you did. Uh, I don't care. It does not matter. Uh, God doesn't care. Uh, he just wants you to receive his word. He wants to that hunger and that thirst and that desire for the Word of God. There has to be a hunger that we put the flesh aside. We cater too much to this flesh to say, whatever the flesh wants to do, that's what i got to do because that's what I depend on. I, I've got to take care of this body. Listen, I believe in that. I believe in taking care of your body. I, I try to keep myself healthy. Why? Because it's this body that's going to be used to glorify God. So for me to live as Christ, then yes, for me to live is to take care of this vessel that he gave me, not to do what it wants to do, not to impress by how it appears to others that I can be equipped to do it for the glory of God. And so that's our reason for living. Hell gets a lot of glory in Christians who have no desire to do anything, and the enemy is going to get us to a place that we can't effectively fight him because we don't realize, don't come to the conclusion that it's spiritual. Communism substituted the state of God. It promised a material paradise in place of the kingdom of God. Communism was spiritual. It was born in hell. Our country tried battling a political machine with words, but there was only one answer, and that was the power of God. That's what we're seeing. Seeing material front, material, materialism. The biggest thing is about bigger houses, bigger pieces of land, nicer vehicles. It's all about materialism. But it should be about spiritual. Church has got to become what we're supposed to be. And the only way that that can happen is for the saints to receive the Holy Ghost. But to believe what God said that the Holy Ghost would bring into our lives and then act with boldness upon that belief. So our faith must rise above merely asking for things. When we begin to evaluate our prayer life, how much of it, of it is asking for things? Lord, give me this. Lord, give me this. Lord, I need this. Lord, this one needs that. Faith comes from God. Therefore, it's against everything that is not of God. So what does that mean? Our prayers sometimes sound more like begging. We spend more time pleading with God to do something, and then that begins to flow over. All the while, God wants to bring his power against the things that hinder us. But here we are. We beg God to do what God has already done in the spiritual world. But all he wants to do is to take the power given us by his spirit and come against the problem. We're, we're saying, well, I'll, I'll pray about that. God said, you don't have to pray about it. I've already given it to you. Put it to action. Step out in faith. And we begin to, to beg God uh, to heal and beg God to do this and to beg God to do that. And all the while, uh, God said, you've already got that power. Such as I have, give I unto thee. Do it. Uh, we pray for revival. That's good because God wants revival. But we've got to move in faith uh, and move beyond prayer and have revival. 
We pray, Lord, send revival. Well, it's time that we as the saints begin to just realize that we've got to take that beyond and know that there are powers warring against the move of God. There's demons spawned in hell that are against anything that resembles a true revival. And we've got to realize those things have to be removed. God didn't say, I'm going to remove them. What he said was, I give you power over all the power of the enemy. If we refuse to exercise the power, we will become victims of the enemy that God said he gave us the power to overcome. If we will become aggressive in that warfare and allow God to open our eyes so that we can recognize our enemy, then we will put our faith against the powers of darkness in this battlefield, that altar of prayer, and then the victory will be ours. We have to get to the place we pray, Lord, send revival, but then we schedule revival. Everything and anything keeps us out of revival. We, we pray, Lord, send, send revival to our church. Give us an outpouring of, of the Holy Ghost. What, what does it benefit if we pray for the Lord all week long? Lord, let the power fall on Sunday morning. We don't even do what it takes to get here on Sunday morning. Sunday night, Wednesday night, we go through the motions we talk real religious and uh, we talk uh, all of these things of what we want. And, and God says, I want that too. Lord, send revival. He said, I want you to have revival. Lord, save, sanctify, fill with the Holy Ghost. He said, I want to do that, but I need a church uh, that has put themselves in a position uh, to quit being distracted, uh, to make the prayer meeting, uh, to stop the prayer meeting from being the less attended meeting. Uh, uh, we can't say that we're ready for revival when we can't even get to, to a time of prayer. Uh, when it comes time to prayer, it seems like everything and anything else uh, comes to our mind. Uh, it, it should be uh, that we were gathering to bombard the portals of glory and realize uh, that God wants to bring that victory to us. God never told Moses to go down and find a place somewhere behind the pyramid to pray for deliverance of God's people. He said, I'm sending you there in my name to deliver the people. Go, says go, God is saying to you and me the same thing. Go, whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, Matthew 16 and 19. It doesn't say God will loose it or bind it. It says that he gives you and me the power to do it in his name. We've been given his name. His name has been placed upon us. We are his A plan, church. He has placed, we are the body of Christ, members in particular. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. He's back in glory. It's up to us. If the church fails, it's because we failed. If the power goes out, it's because we allowed the power to go out. If the fire goes out, it's because we didn't trim the wick. It's because we didn't bring the oil. It's because we didn't prepare ourselves. God says, I want to do it, but I need a church that is willing to do it, willing to be used. We're saying, he's saying, give me a vessel. Remember that story of the widow woman that she got excited because as long as there was vessels, her sons were bringing her vessels. That little bit of oil that she had, it kept filling up vessels. And she said, bring me yet another vessel. And they said, there's not a vessel more. And that's the place that we've gotten to in the church. God said, bring me another vessel. There, there's preachers and pastors saying, give me another vessel. There's nobody else that wants it. There, there's nobody else that wants the oil. There, there's nobody else that, that wants the power. I, I understand tonight there's people that's, that on Wednesday night they're out because they're sick and they just can't be here. And those are the ones that take it to heart when preachers say things like I say tonight. But you look around and it would be a sad thing to know in our church that our membership is, I believe, 52. And we average, we can average attend. We have average attendance 60 to 65. But one, two, three, four five six seven eight nine adults uh, in the wednesday night setting of our service uh, to know that if is that the case that that's all that wants this power uh, is that all that wants revival we know that's not the case uh, because like i said there's those who absolutely want to be here uh, but cannot be here uh, but even if you added those in uh, you probably have 15 to 20 uh, that's the sad state bring me a vessel uh, bring me somebody that's hungry uh, bring me somebody uh, I, I prayed and said god give me a 
the message uh, and give me somebody to deliver that message to. Uh, and we sing uh, and we pray. And my prayer is I wish somebody's soul would catch on fire. Lord, give me somebody to preach. Give me somebody to pour into. Uh, give me somebody uh, to, to invest in. Uh, give me somebody to, to disciple. Uh, so I don't take it lightly. Uh, some people told me, Brother Jamie, you preach the same to four as you would 40. Uh, because God gave me somebody uh, that wants to hear what God has to say. Uh, I think it's more important to preach to four than it is 40 or 400. Uh, and know that that four is hungry uh, for the word of God. Uh, and so they must be fed the word of God. Uh, and so we're praying for revival. And we're looking for this power. Uh, and God is saying, I've given you that power. Uh, if we refuse to exercise that power, we become victims of the enemy that God said he gave us the power over. If we will become aggressive in this warfare and allow God to open up our eyes so that we can then recognize our enemy, we will put our faith against the powers of darkness in that battlefield. We've got to get a hold of that. We've got to take hold of that with aggression and with power and understand unless we aggressively take the battle to the enemy, we're never going to see the victory. God's people have put up with things that we don't have to put up with. Too many times we put up with stuff that we do not have to put up with. We have to take authority over it. Church allows the enemy to make us indifferent to the real issues of life. We become involved in a lot of religious activities while the devil makes himself comfortable right in our midst. Right in our midst. And we've got to be careful of that. We have to understand that when the devil can blind the church to the real issues, the people will get excited about a lot of things that are not relevant. They're just looking for anything to excite. They're being entertained. They're being moved by every wind of doctrine. That's where you get all of this crazy junk that begins to, to go on. They, they begin to gold dust, falling from the ceiling and just creating, trying to create some kind of excitement. Let me tell you something. If the Holy Ghost can't excite you, don't depend on me to try to excite you. I'm not that exciting. See, Sister Amy, no, come on. He ain't. He's dull as dull can be. If the Holy Ghost can't set your soul on fire, I don't have a special match that's going to do it. We, if we're saved, if our soul has been delivered from hell, we've got something to praise God about. And we should be looking to press beyond where we're at to sanctification and Holy Ghost power. I have never understood saved and satisfied. I've never understood, Phew, I'm saved, I'm going to miss hell. Now let me just sit here and wait for the rapture to take place. Uh, you might be sitting there beyond the rapture if that's your attitude. Uh, to understand that we've got to be prayed up, filled up, ready to be used for God to say, Okay, Lord, you saved me, what now? Which way do you want to shoot me? Which way uh, do you want to sling me? How, wherever you want me to be. I'm a soldier, uh, and I'm here to do the business of the king. Uh, and in order to do that, I have got to be against the enemy. We can't align ourselves with the enemy. We read in the book of Nehemiah where Nehemiah, uh, Brother George talked about him rebuilding the wall. He rebuilt the wall, and all of that was done. Well, Nehemiah had got permission from the king to leave. Well, he had to go back. And so when Nehemiah went back, everything was operating and functioning well. And I've preached this before about a side room for the devil. But Nehemiah went back, and while Nehemiah was back, the priest, the man that was put there uh, to, to lead and take care of it, uh, had an alignment with Tobiah. And Tobiah was one, uh, and Sabalat, uh, and Tobiah was ones that had an allegiance against Nehemiah, trying to stop him from building the wall. And while Nehemiah's gone, uh, this priest uh, lets him move in, uh, not to just any room, but the room that held the grain and the oil and all the important things for the worship service. So, so that was all infected now by this one who was the enemy, and he let him in. And so here's this guy that's supposed to be having some kind of discernment, just buddies up with the enemy. We can't buddy up with the enemy. We can't have an alliance with the enemy. We can't have give the devil any place. One man said you give the devil an inch, he'll be your 
your ruler. Uh, if you give the devil a ride, uh, he'll be driving after a while. Uh, we can't give him any place, but that priest gave him place in the temple. Uh, everything was contaminated. Uh, Nehemiah didn't get, get back and say, all right, buddy, uh, you've got to tell him to get out. Uh, he didn't wait for him to get out. Nehemiah booted him out himself and said, clear all that junk out of there, uh, fumigate that room, uh, and let's start over again. Uh, we can't allow the devil uh, to get a corner room of our life and stay there for a little while uh, and just say, well, devil, you got to go. Please leave. Uh, no, we've got to kick him out, uh, but it's not enough to kick the devil out. Uh, you've got to fumigate that place. Uh, how do we fumigate it? Uh, we say we pray until we pray through in the Spirit uh, and say, Holy Ghost, uh, cleanse that place. Uh, blood of Jesus wash over that place uh, and get it to a place that uh, we're not in alignment with the enemy uh, because there'll come times that people will be in alignment and make relationships with the enemy. We have to understand, give no place to the devil. I'm a soldier, and I'm on business for God. I must be against the enemy. Can't give him any place, any place in our lives whatsoever. We are not the usurpers, the devil is. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, 1 Corinthians 10, 26. The fullness in turn belongs to the child of God. He may be the prince of the power of the air, but the fullness thereof belongs to the Lord. But the meek shall inherit the earth, is what it tells us in Psalms 37 and 11. Buddha may sit in his temple. Men may give him their worship, that there's going to come a time when Buddha will be dispossessed. The church of God would exert its faith against the darkness. Millions of Asians would find their way to God. In America, millions of people belong to churches. Because they do, they feel in their heart that they have done all that is necessary. My name's on the roll. My name's on the roll. Their name's on the roll, but their butt's not on the pew. Amen. And their name's on the roll. And I would say it's not even enough to have your butt on the pew. I don't think we've had service if our butt stayed on the pew the whole service. I think we've really had church when we hadn't had time to sit on the pew. Because the cathedral sing, when the Holy Spirit starts to move it in my soul, something happens that I can't control. I start clapping. I don't know why. My feet start moving. It gets in my hands. It gets in my feet. I can't stay still. We know we've had church when the Spirit of God begins to move and understand that it's not just that we as millions of Americans belong to a church. Because we do, we feel like that our hearts, that we've done all that is necessary. But there's those of us who know differently. We've done not much more, though, to criticize them. We let them fall into that complacency. But if truth were known, a great part of those millions are really hungry for God. But they've never received the truth. Therefore, they're blind. Why is that? Because many of them are led by preachers who just want to tickle their ears. Just, just want them to be happy. I'm so glad that you're apart. That's wonderful. It's wonderful to have people apart, but they need the truth. They need the truth. People are being deceived. You look at it. We see, we see some things, some gatherings sometimes, and, and my family's asked me this. Amy, as a young Christian, asked, she still asks me to this day. I don't get it. And Noah's asked me the question. We see some people, uh, see some situations, some groups that are supposed to be uh, church, but you know they're not preaching the truth, and they're so far out there, but yet they're the masses masses they gotta have five and six services just to get them all in well it's easy to say well people just run after that that don't require anything of it to a degree i think that's true but to another degree they've got a man in there who is very very attracting in his ability he obviously has an ability to attract people they've got some kind of ability to draw a crowd but when they get the crowd there those people are hungry for something, but they don't give them the truth. And so, therefore, that group of people keeps going out and living the same lifestyle. Why? Because nobody's ever told them that what you're doing 
needs to change. That if any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. They avoid all of that. Why? I don't know why, but it's a dangerous place to be in. But I believe many of those millions are hungry for the truth. They're hungry for the truth. And it's up to us to tell them the truth. It's up to us to share with them the true gospel of Jesus Christ. But he said, if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. 2 Corinthians 4, 2, 3 and 4. If God has given us power over the devil, we should be able to pull the blindfold off and let the light in. Jesus said, I give. If Jesus said, I give, then we as the church should be able to say, I have. Because if Jesus is given, he's not giving it to the world. He's giving it to the church. He's given it to us. In closing tonight, the battlefield is right here at this altar. The battlefield is right there in your prayer closet, that altar that you have at home. That's where the battlefield is at. We don't have any trouble getting somebody to preach. I've had different ones preaching on Sunday night. I can make a phone call and get someone to preach just about every service. Hundreds of people to fill the pulpit of the church. There's no shortage of preachers. But we could run a full page ad in the evangel asking for intercessors, and the response would be nothing. Nothing. You sure about that, Brother Jamie? Well, yeah, I'm pretty sure because we call prayer meeting Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. I see very few. And that's not to down this church, it's everywhere I've ever been. Prayer meeting. Every pastor I've ever talked to, they'll tell me, How's your prayer meeting? the least attended service of all services people say oh they're just praying it's i can pray at home but do you (laughs) that's the question do you i i can i'm not gonna drive all the way out there in the middle of nowhere just to pray oh if we would drive all the way out the middle of nowhere just to pray we might see something happen we might see something happen that we get hungry for prayer again that's the case but that's where we do our battle with the enemy yet it's in prayer the battle's won in prayer the real warfare takes place when a man puts his faith against the powers of darkness and that always takes place at the altar of God when we preach it's the results of prayer when we sing it's the results of prayer when souls are saved it's the results of prayer We should do nothing until we pray. But when we pray, when we pray, if you'll begin to pray like you've never prayed before during the week, you say, I wish our pastor preached better. I'd preach better if you'd pray more during the week. Because when we begin to fuel it with prayer, when we begin to see it, we say, man, I wish they would sing better. They'll sing better under a greater anointing if we'll pray. I would love to see more souls saved in our church. Well, more souls that get saved when we make up our mind that the warfare takes place when we pray. It's not about fighting against whatever comes down the pike next. I understand all of that, that we've got to take a stand. And, but it's not about... Brother Clendenin was big on this, and I agree with it. It's not about getting, getting involved in another march. Or signing another petition, or marching on White House, getting on their front lawn, holding up our signs, telling people what we believe in. Black Lives Matter was at 218 in Blanding a couple weeks ago on Saturday morning. I wasn't across the street with another sign. I had better things to do than stand there and argue with a bunch of people. But if we would take it to a prayer closet, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. My enemy is not somebody holding a sign that stands for what they stand for. It's not for some LGBT or whatever their initials are that's standing out there telling me how proud they are to be gay. Well, what do you for you? I'm glad you're happy to be gay. I'm happy that you're glad whatever makes you happy. But what makes me happy is when God breaks that bond and when somebody's able to testify, testify, that I was bound by homosexuality, but Jesus set me free. 
They're not going to be set free with us arguing with them about why they're wrong for being gay. No, they're going to be set free when we get into a prayer closet and begin to pray like we've never prayed before and realize that our battles are won on our knees, on our face, pacing the floor, however you pray. That's where aggressive faith comes in. And then it goes beyond the prayer closet. But you, you can't go beyond the prayer closet until you first pray. We go out there and try to do a bunch of stuff, and it don't work. It's like throwing something up against the wall and hoping it sticks. I'll just keep trying. Well, why don't we just get our marching orders first? Lord, what would you have me to do? And we do that through prayer. And then God will send us in the direction. And then we'll just shoot that arrow one time and it'll hit the mark. We'll step into it and we'll go straight to where God wanted us to go to. And then we're amazed. We're amazed at how God worked that out, how it happened. And how God crossed somebody in our path at just the right time. And we've spent months looking for somebody to witness to. God said, I can't give you nobody to witness to. You don't have nothing to say because you hadn't talked to me. But when we begin to talk to him and he gives us something to say, before you know it, he'll be bringing all kinds of people your way. Why? Because you've got something to give, such as I have. Jesus has given it. Problem is we haven't realized what we got, who we are what we possess. And so we have to take that aggressively. The kingdom of heaven suffers violent, and the violent take it by force. How many of us are willing to push beyond the flesh tonight into an altar of prayer and say, Lord, I want that kind of aggressive faith. I don't want to just talk about revival. I want to be revival. I don't want to just talk about breakthrough. I want to be breakthrough. I don't want to just talk about restoration. I want to be one that has been restored to say, you're looking at restoration. That's got to be our desire. Can we just move into these altars tonight, church? Let's just begin to pray. Let's just begin to talk to the Lord. Not, Lord, give me this and Lord, give me that. But Lord, I need that power. I need that aggressive faith. Fill us with your spirit tonight, Lord. Father, as we move into these altars tonight, I pray, God, that you would just fill hungry hearts. For you said those that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. And I pray, God, that you'd fill the hunger of our soul, that we'd be aggressive in our faith, and our confidence will be in you tonight. Do the work that only you can tonight in these altars. We ask it in Jesus' name.